Uh, our next case is going to be Mr. Gennaro Sims. Mr. Sims, would you please uh, give us your full name and DOC number? Gennaro Sims, 412045. Mr. Sims, this is a uh, revocation hearing uh, today. Uh, I want to go over our process with you. First, I'm going to read, uh, I'm going to go over with you your parole revocation questionnaire. And then I'm going to go through uh, the allegations that are alleged reasons uh, alleged that you have violated your parole. And then I'm going to ask you as to each violation or alleged violation, how do you plead? Guilty, not guilty, guilty with the statement or not guilty with the statement. And then at the appropriate time, those persons who wish to speak will allow them to have their input. You have several people here speaking on your behalf. Your mother, Ms. Diana Sims, is here. Uh, you have an attorney, Ms. Kat Kearney. Uh, you have uh, your child's mother, uh, Trinesha Glover, and a member of the defense team, Ms. Mia Barr. Uh, would uh, Ms. Kearney please uh, make an appearance for the record? Yes, this is Kat Kearney representing Gennaro Sims. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, and we also have in opposition, uh, Agent Bertrand, who was your parole officer. So, uh, do you have your uh, parole revocation questionnaire before you? No, sir. Okay. Uh, is that your signature at the bottom of the page? Or did you not sign it? There's an X there. Never got a chance to sign it. Okay. Well, let's go over it. Uh, are the answers, have you had an opportunity to look over the answers? Yeah. Are those answers accurate and correct? Yes, sir. And you are represented uh, today by Ms. Kearney? Yes, sir. Are you ready to proceed with our hearing? Yes, sir. Okay, the first allegation is that on May the 31st of 2023, you were arrested by the New Orleans Police Department for resisting an officer, resisting arrest by refusing to give identity and simple assault. The charges of resisting an officer or resisting arrest by refusing identity are still being screened, apparently, in the uh, New Orleans uh, District Attorney's Office. The there's an, yes. Sorry, there's an update to that. Um, should I provide that now or wait? Yes, you can. Um, on Friday, um, Mr. Sims pled guilty to refusing ID, and the simple assault charge and the other resisting charge were null prost by the District Attorney. Yeah, the simple assault charge initially was no probable cause was found by the magistrate, but he's actually pled guilty to the uh, resisting by refusing identity and the other resisting charge was dismissed. That's correct. Yes. So how would uh, what is his plea today? I read, I read the well, um, plea on which on which one as far as the um, the identity. Well, on May the thirty first of twenty twenty three, the way these things are written, it's very difficult to be able to to, to make a statement. So I'm going to read a couple of things. Okay, on March the thirty first of twenty twenty three, you were arrested by the New Orleans Police Department for resisting an officer, resisting arrest, refusing identity, and simple assault. That is a fact, so no one disputes that. The charges uh, of resisting an officer, re resisting uh, by uh, refusing identity, uh, were still in the screening process. That's no longer true. We now know that you pled guilty to the refusing identification, so I assume to that allegation you plead guilty, to the others you plead not guilty. Is that fair to say? Yes, sir. Okay. And uh, finally, to date, you are $630 in arrears on your supervision fees and have failed to remit any payments since being released on supervision. How do you plead to that? Those um, payments are paid all the way out, sir. Okay, you've paid. I know that I have, I have proof that you paid $600. You still owe 30. Have you paid the remaining 30 as well? I think those 30 paid too, sir. All right. So I'll, I'll put not guilty with the statement. Uh, okay, your case has been assigned to me. So uh, I am uh, 
I'm going to start asking some questions of you, okay? So tell me what happened on May the 31st of 2023. What happened was I went around an area that I haven't been around in a minute, saw some older people that I knew, decided to get out and speak to them. That's when the officer pulled up and was calling me, telling me to come to the car. And I'm being honest, I asked him for what would I done? Let him raise my shirt up, let him see that I wasn't doing nothing. You know, like, what you want with me? Why you want me to come to the car, officer? He kept telling me to come in, had no reason to tell me why I had to come to the car. He just was like, come here, come here, come here, out of everybody that was out there. So I kind of like was getting scared, worried, like why he want me to come in telling me what I'd done or nothing. I basically walked off knowing, reading on the law book and stuff and being honest, I walked off. He jumped out the car and just started coming after me. And I kind of got scared and just ran from him. That's when they apprehended me and they read my rights and stuff. And then you come back and was asking me my name. And I told him that I wanted to talk to my lawyer, you know? And from there, it's just, they took me to the hospital because they had, was doing all type of stuff, roughing me up, searching me wrong, sticking his fingers all through my butt cheeks, trying to find stuff. And then they you know, brought me to the hospital. I kind of like um, told them I wanted to talk to and take it to about the officer behavior from him, you know, searching me wrong, putting his fingers and up my buttocks and, that's when the lady, Kimberly Hunt, I think her name, came, spoke to me. I initially went down to Central Lockup. When I went to Central Lockup, I was just charged with two charges. But I guess once they found out who I was, because I never told them my name or nothing, uh, they fingerprinted, found out who I was. That's when the officer come back, and he must have found out that I told the integrity bureau, the lady, about what he did. He come back and he put a simple assault charge on me and it's a mess over me and put a parole hold on me. All right. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about it. You got paroled on June the 11th of 2022, right? Yes, sir. What were you doing? What have you done? Or what were you doing before you were arrested on May the 31st of 2023? What were I doing? Um, right. I, Is that right? Yes, sir. I was working. Okay, so almost a year, 11 months. What were you doing in those 11 months? Where were you living? What were you, were you working? Yes, sir, I got more. What kind of work were you doing? I, I started a pressure washer business and a car wash business. And both of the paperwork, showing that I'm registered. With okay, uh, we, we're just talking right now. We, we'll get to, I'm, I'm, I'm going, if I want some proof or something, I'll ask, okay? Uh, so I, how often were you working? I was working every, like, Monday through Friday, and I was also uh, being a father, going home, with, with my kid's mother, yeah. tending to her, going to all the apartments, being a father, trying to stay out there with the- let, let, me, let me ask you a question. Do you have a nickname? No, sir. Anybody call you Gutta or Gouda, G-U-T-T-A? That was something that was way when I was a kid. I'm no longer- Well, is that, is that a nickname that you've been called? When I was a kid, a long time yeah, ago. Is that written anywhere in your rap sheet or anything like that? So I never told nobody that. Well, the officer said he recognized you as Gouda or Gutter or whatever that name is. I believe. Someone, well, well, let me think. The police report suggests that he recognized you as someone who he had information that might have been dealing drugs in that neighborhood. Why would he say that? If, 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 is that your nickname? It's a nickname you had many years ago? Why would he say that? Sure, that was um like when I came to jail last time when I before I got out, that was something that that somebody had said then. So I guess they went back off of that and tried to hook me up with this by saying things. But Mr. Mr. Sims, let me let let me let me say something to you right now. Okay, I have read your report. I have read everything about that report. I am sympathetic in some respects to you and what happened to you. But I'll be damned if I'm gonna sit here and let you lie to me. I won't, I wouldn't. I wanna know exactly what happened. Now, if you tell me exactly what happened that night, 
then you might get a favorable vote for me. But if you don't, then you're not going to get one. And let me tell you where I'm coming from. I have read your report. You weren't reporting to your parole officer. You were not home when you were supposed to be home. You called your parole officer. You complained and you screamed at them about harassing your mother because they were looking for you. You got an anger issue. Now that doesn't justify anything the police might have done to you. But had you behaved yourself that night and just shut up and answered their questions, we wouldn't be sitting here. That I can vouch and say you're right on that. If I would have just cooperated, I wouldn't be here. I so can't why didn't you? I apologize. Huh? So why did if you didn't, you know, I, look, I've been in the criminal justice system for 50 years. I was a defense lawyer, a prosecutor, and a judge. So I know what the law is, and I know all about what cops do sometimes and what happens to people out there. But you're on parole, okay? And I know laymen say, well, if you didn't do anything, why did you run? Well, I know people run even when they don't do anything. So I want to know why you did what you did that night when that officer approached you. So tell me that. Scared, just always being a rat bomb. It was a situation going on, on, ongoing situation with my lawyer Wayne Wright. Those officers also shot at me before for no reason. And I had a complaint on them. So it's like I'm scared of them. Wayne but Wright is my lawyer. Whoa, whoa, complaint on who? Those officers of the first district, the same officers. The, the lawyer that I had was Wayne Wright, Gary Wayne Wright. He was. He got the recordings. You can call him right now. He had the recordings. He gave it to so the- So you knew Officer Bell? I don't know him by, by face. I can't say which ones I uh, won't lie and say, yeah, All I right. know. Okay. okay. But Do I know- you know that. you by your nickname? I never saw that officer before, sir. Never. I never could say that this is an officer that I had encountered with. I don't know who he is. My lawyer asked me that. I can't say that- okay. So, so, so now tell me what happened and why you did what you did. Why did you run? Scared. I can't give you no other reason because I'd be lying. I was scared. I didn't know what to do. I knew now, the police report suggests that you had a backpack at some point that was gone. It was uh, thrown away when you made your 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 runaway or whatever you did to get away. So they got cameras all around and please find a way to get those cameras. And it was sure I never had a book sack that, that could corroborate with my statements. They also said they found a live nine millimeter round on you. Did you have a bullet in your pocket? Not that I recall of. He, I saw the well, bullet. Uh, uh, come on. Don't give me that don't recall business. Did you have one or didn't you? I didn't have no gun, no, put no bullet on me, no gun on me, no nothing, sir. I didn't have none of that on me, sir. So they have a bullet in evidence, supposedly, and they say they found it on you. That's not true. Sir, I didn't have a bullet on me, sir. I can't say that I have one. I, I, I can admit that's not a crime. I didn't have one. I can admit to that. That's not a crime, but. So what, what happened? Tell me exactly what happened. Where were you when the officer saw you and, and you decided to either run or walk away or whatever you did? Tell me exactly what you did. I was talking to a woman and an older guy that was out there. And he was talking and the police pulled, they actually pulled the first saws out there. Then they pulled off and then came back on that corner, sir, and just was telling me to come here. And I was just trying to ask why. What was the reason why did I have to come to that car? He just, he never gave me a direct statement like saying I've done something. I'm a suspect or something. So that's why I kind of like with the getting scared, like, what do you want with me? I also raised my shirt up, sir, showing him that I'm not doing anything. I have nothing on me. You know, he's not being truthful and telling y'all exactly what went on. If you can get those cameras that's out there, that would corroborate with everything. I tried everything that I could. Well, I want to know what you did. What did you do after you pulled up your shirt 
to show him you didn't have anything. I turned around, let him ask him, like, officer, what do you want with me? And he like, come here. He was trying to use his authority to make me come. And I was like, officer, what did I do? Tell me what did I do? He was like, come here. And I'm like, man, I don't know what this is about. So I walked off. I'm being honest. He jumped and out the car. Did you walk off or did you run off? I walked off. He jumped and out where the Where did you go? I went to walking up the street. That's when he got out the car and went to coming behind me. And I well, looked he said you got in an elevator. Did you ever get in any kind of an elevator? Yes, after I ran up the street. Okay, and ran. well, tell me what all you did. I, you you I walked ran. down the street and then what did you do? He came, I ran, I ran through the, the, the um behind the building, then I hopped the fence. I hopped the fence. I went up trying to get into the elevator. Uh, the officer then came up in there. Uh, the elevator was closing. He stuck his hand up in there trying to, like, you know, open, stop from closing. Uh, that's when the officer, I see, got his gun on me. And he was like, you know, like telling me to freeze, freeze, freeze. And I'm still scared. And I just ran from out the elevator, you know what I'm saying, on him. And he came running behind me. And that's when I was hitting, hiding someplace up in the building. And that's when I guess the, one of the people that was standing there, lived there, or whatever, uh, out there, happened to see me going to the hiding spot that I was at. That's when they told the officer where I was at. That's when the officers came right there and, you know, did whatever they did, you know, pulled me out there, threw me to the ground and everything. And that's when this bullet just come out. And he was like, get that, get that, get that. And I'm looking at it and I, I just shut up. I ain't seen nothing. It was bumming to the police car. Uh, I couldn't breathe. I kept letting them know I couldn't breathe and this and that. Duh. That's when they called the EMS. The EMS came and that's when the officer take me back, back from out the car. And he went to improperly searching me, putting his hands between my cheeks and stuff. And I yelled out to him. I'm like, no, get your hand between, from between my cheeks. And that's when they took me to the hospital. I go, to, go to the hospital for? I go there for breathing, not breathing, several things. They had the handcuffs so tight on me. It's, it's all type of stuff. My wrist, they hurt in my wrist. Uh -huh. uh, uh, I hit my head also when I was running my chin, I, I guess, I don't know how I hit the chin, I'm being honest. I can't say the police officer done that. I think maybe me hopping over what I would hop at and I fell face down on it, but it kind of like blacked me out a little bit, you know. Uh, uh, then I was in the hospital letting them know what the officer done to me. I told him I want to talk to somebody. Right. Well, tell me, tell me why you were having so much trouble. Why was your parole officer having so much trouble getting in touch with you? My parole officer would come there early in the morning to my house, and I wasn't there in the morning because I was going trying to get my business started. You know, I leave out early in the morning working, trying to find jobs, working and stuff, you know, with my company, trying to get that going. You know, that was the only reason why I wasn't there. I, I got 10 churn all together. Two of them is my grand churn. I support Mr. Sims, Mr. Sims, on January the 24th of 2023, he tried to get in touch with you. Went to your place, no contact. January 25th of 2023, no contact. February 13th of 2023, no contact. February 14th of 23, no contact. February 17th of 23, you called him, very angry, screaming and hollering at him. February 22nd, 23, no contact. February 24th of 23, phone contact. March 28th of 23, no contact. April 19th, 23, no contact. May 16th, 23, no contact. Finally, on June 1st, you arrest him. So, you know, why couldn't your parole officer get in touch with you? You know, here I got a guy. What about the times I told him? Let, let me finish. Here I got a guy whose parole officer is trying to get in touch with him, can't get in touch with him. And when he finally talks with him, you scream and holler at him. And then you get arrested. And then you smart off to the cops and you run. Now, what's wrong with that picture? Sir, I can't recall all those times that he contacted me. I talked to him on the phone and everything, letting him know about my business and everything. I so why did you scream and holler at him when you talk to him on the phone? So you deny that he's here. So we can hear from him. He's right there. I don't see me hollering at him. You may have took that the wrong way the way I talked. You may have thought I was hollering at him. I have a deep verse and I do talk a little loud at times, you know, 
I can't say, I can't be a little adamant about saying, but like, no, you know, be talking up, like, as he told, I might be like, no, no, that wasn't it, I'm doing, you know, I can't say, that's a problem that I have to deal with that I'm working on every day. I know I do not know how to communicate right. You know what I'm saying? So I can just say that I'm sorry and I regret it if he felt like that I was talking, yelling at him, but that wasn't my intentions. That's not something I do when I know that he holds. Let me, let me, ask, you a question. Let me ask you a question. If you had to do this all over again, what might you do different with your parole officer? What might you have done differently with your parole officer? Check in with him every day, every every other week. Would let him know exactly what's going on, updating him on my whereabouts, my where I'm living, how how I'm going, how my business is taking off, or whatever. You know, I, I wouldn't keep things away from him, but I just it's what no. What might you have done differently the night the policeman? saw you and asked you to come to see, come over to him. What might you have done differently that night? I realized that I was wrong all the way around with that because reason why I've read into the law book and I noticed that an officer have, if they know that you're on parole, that they have the right to stop you. That's something I didn't know to ask. So now I'm informed on that. And I would have laid up there and went to that car and talked to him and see what was the problem. You know, but I'm being honest with you, it escaped me the hell to death, but that's something I know what I have to go on and face my fears and do. I'm sorry that I've done that because it ended me up in here, making me miss my kids, my kid being born. Uh, it's a whole lot I lost out on. It's a whole lot I'm losing out on. Um, I'm sorry for everything I did that that a person may, uh, may reflect that I was doing any kind of wrong when I know that it, my intention was on it to do right out there and provide for my family. I mean, that's my first time ever getting in trouble that day. Uh, and with the parole officer, just basically, he's saying that I wasn't there responding because I was so busy trying to- Let me ask you this. Do you have some injuries on your left hand? Yes, sir. What? Show me what you got. This finger right here been shot off and just, just real place. Uh, real attached, and this one right here too. Can you move those fingers at all? I could do that. I can't, can't do this. Can't make a fist. I can't ball them up. I can't write with them. I can't do nothing. All I'm moving is these three fingers, really. Tell me about your family. You have children? Yes, sir. How many uh, children do you have? I have 10 all together. Um, two of them is my grandchildren that I call my kids. Uh, Who were you living with while you've been out on parole for the last 11 months? I've been with both my moms right there. Okay. And where are your children and how old are your children? Uh, one of them, 19, one of them like 23. I have a stepson I also call mine too, that I raised since he was a kid. You know, uh, he's like 24. Uh, I have my other kids who's with their mother, uh, and I have a younger kid who with his mother, he's, who's nine, who's 11 years old, and I just had a kid that was born June 26th of this year, and you I was- A grandchild born, you said? No, my own kid. That's Your own child? And yeah, how old is, is he? Six, she's six weeks old. Okay. My grandchildren, they one and year- And where's the mother? Huh, sir? Who is the mother and where is she? She's right there, Trenisha Glover. She's right there. Um, were y'all living together? No, sir. Okay. Question. Okay, now we're going to hear from uh, your supporters. Uh, let's hear from uh, Ms. Glover. Um, I'm, I just want to say that um, doing everything, being a, a new mom again after 17 years, it's put a strain on me and me having to do everything on my own. Oh, I just wish that he was here to help me because it would be much more, like it would be less stressful. I'm going through um, postpartum stress and it's just real. It's, it's a big strain on me and I wish he was here to help me. 
while he was out, was he supporting you? Was he helping you in any way? Yes. Um, tell, me, tell me how. Every day I would get um I would get breakfast and lunch, dinner, and come into my appointments with me. I had a few, um, I had a, since I'm 35, I had a geriatric pregnancy. So I had to go to the doctor numerous of times. I was like spot and he was there. Like he, it was it was much more better. You know, when he was did he help me. support you financially? Yes. How did he do that? What did he do? He paid my light bill, my um my light bill and my car insurance to help me out. And what are your plans for the future? Assuming he gets back on I need I need him here with me because I have to get back to my life in order to make money for myself. Who's when you say you need him here with you, do you intend on living with him or what? No, but I intend on him getting this baby so I can do some things for myself. You know, because it's just like I it's just me, 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 and it's a lot of pressure on me right now. It's a real a lot of pressure. Thank you very much, Ms. Glover. Uh, now let's hear from uh, Ms. Sims, your mother. Hi, how you Good doing? Good morning, Ms. Sims. How are you? I'm Tell okay. us what you'd like us to know about uh, your son. Uh, he's my advocate. He's always there for me, making sure I'm taking my medication. He uh, do errands for me when I, to make sure I eat the right proper food. I'm uh, asthmatic and I'm a uh, diabetic and uh, he makes sure that I'm okay and he do the things around the house to keep the grass and the upkeep of the house uh up and stuff and I'm not able at this time to do these things because uh the weather is hot outside and uh I have the asthma situation and uh he was the one seen to go into the store to make sure I had food and water and uh stuff like that and help towards helping me pay my bills and stuff when I need it. Thank you, Ms. Sims. We appreciate your comments. Uh, let's hear from, uh, I assume, uh, Mrs. Ms. Barr. Yeah. Um, good morning. My name is Mia Barr, and I'm a client advocate in the client services division at the Public Defender's Office. Um, I'm speaking today on behalf of my client, Gennaro Sims, whom I've worked closely with over the last month and I've come to know as deeply thoughtful, intuitive, self-aware, driven, and family-oriented. I've collaborated with Mr. Sims to create a release plan that would allow for safe and secure reentry to the community, and I'm here to respectfully offer an alternative to revocation that will more appropriately address the situation at hand. Since Mr. Sims earned parole last year, he has made enormous strides to reintegrate into the community and change his circumstances. Rather than being a liability to society, Mr. Sims has become an asset to both his family and his community. He is a loving father, partner, and son, and has become a successful entrepreneur. On June 26th, just over a month ago, while he was incarcerated, Mr. Sims' partner gave birth to a baby girl, Princess Tatiana. Princess is now just over a month old and has yet to meet her father. Mr. Sims sees Princess's birth as an opportunity to be an active father and provider, and he is determined to create a different life for her than the life that he has had. Since being released, Mr. Sims, Mr. Sims has founded a successful power washing and car detailing business called Professional Detailing. Prior to starting his business, Mr. Sims had never taken out loans or been approved for a credit card. And Mr. Sims told me that second to his children and grandchildren being born, being approved for both was the best day of his life. His excitement about something that most of us find so mundane is testament to his genuine desire to contribute to society. After earning his high set while previously in DOC custody, he is now eager to pursue further education through Delgado Community College, where he hopes to study economics and business as a mechanism to further advance his business and allow it to grow and expand. Mr. Sims has already been accepted to, to Delgado and his acceptance letter has been submitted as a supplement to the packet or provided earlier. In addition to the concrete steps he has taken, Mr. Sims is looking to ensure he remains free from future incarceration by studying anti-recidivism theory, which he started doing while incarcerated. 
He is eager to prevent others' recidivism as much as his own and finds great power in understanding theories as to how he can most successfully remain permanently in community. I've referred Mr. Sims to the first 72 plus for reentry support and services. And through them, he will also have access to the Fountain Fund, which is a nonprofit that provides low interest loans to formerly incarcerated people. Mr. Sims is also highly motivated to work with mental health professionals and engage in talk therapy. And to that end, I've referred him to Jackson Hands of Change, which is an outpatient community-based counseling service that will meet Mr. Sims in the community as he begins to seek therapy. In summary, even in the face of his present circumstances, Mr. Sims has remained steadfast in his determination to return home to his children, partner in business, in order to continue building the life that he is so proud of, as he should be. In addition to his astounding natural community and familial supports, Mr. Sims will have my continued support upon release, and I will remain available to assist in service access and coordination, including compliance with any court and parole requirements. I'm confident that he will succeed in taking full advantage of a second chance by following the release plan in this letter. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ms. Bach. Uh, Ms. Kearney, I assume you will uh, summarize after uh, Mr. Uh, Sims has an opportunity to speak to us. Yes, sir. Now let's hear from uh, Agent Bertrand. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Um, I've dealt with Mr. Sims prior, also prior to this this parole um, parole time. Um, Mr. Sims has always had a lack of respect for police or authority. Um, at least one other time when we encountered Mr. Sims prior to this parole that we arrested him on charges, it actually turned into physical uh, physical assault by Mr. Sims, which also included attempting to flee in handcuffs uh, when we arrested him at his residence with narcotics. But this this period on parole from shortly after, and it's not just me that had phone conversations. He actually called and was aggressive and very rude to another supervisor and uh, the front desk personnel that was answering the phone. Um, of all the times I went to the house, I've gotten everything from, he left, you know, shortly, you know, he leaves about seven o'clock. Cause if someone as a parole officer, someone tells me what their schedule is then I know how to work my schedule. Uh, but if you tell me that you leave and you're leaving home at seven o'clock or your family's telling me you're leaving home at seven o'clock, and I show up at your house at six in the morning and still nothing. And they can, the only thing I get from the family is, well, he's here sometimes. Um, and, or always just left five minutes before I get there. I've been doing this quite a long time. And to me, that says you're actually not staying there. So by trying to ask Mr. Sims, if you give me the address that you actually stay, then we can, this makes the go a lot easier. But in order to keep saying you stay at the same address and then every conversation I ever have with you when you do return my phone calls, it is always it is always very aggressive and calling and saying, why you talk to my mother? Because we do question their family. We're, we're trying to avoid situations like this, because if we can avoid it getting to this point, then we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. But if he has no no willingness really to participate in being supervised on parole, then we can't. We can't help that. Thank you very much, uh, Agent. We appreciate uh, your comments. Uh, Mr. Sims, is there anything you'd like to say before uh, we turn it over to uh, Ms. Kearney? Uh, I would like to say that um, to Officer Bertrand that I never intended to be in the like hostile way, I talk a little deep and still working on the way that I communicate. And if I have made like I was coming off wrong, that wasn't my intentions, and I'm really sorry. And I never lied to you about where I stay. I really do stay there, and the reason why is because I want to be there for my mom. My mom don't have nobody or somebody backbone, you know. And um, I help my mom. I don't just help my mom. So I help my sister, my niece, my nephew. I feel like I'm the head of that family. I feel like it's a lot that I need to do to support them. I feel like that I don't want to let them know. I feel like that I've been incarcerated all my life. And I feel like before anything happened to my mom, I want to show her that her son 
is doing right, has changed for the better and accomplished a whole lot. I want to show her that I'm doing good. And the reason why I choose to stay there is because it's, it better, it helps me manage my money. I don't have to go pay, you know, a rent and nothing nowhere else when I could just help my moms. I really have a room up there. If you ever would have come to my room, you'd have saw how that room has fi been fixed up from when I ain't have nothing up in there. My clothes is up in there. Uh, and I know things may have probably been seemed inaccurate about the times that I was leaving, getting up and going to work and stuff, but all that's truthful. I know it may seem like it wasn't, but it's really truthful. And um, if I can just get the opportunity to get back about there into society to prove myself, to show the better person I am and where I've learned from my mistakes. And I see where you may feel like that I was doing wrong. And I could acknowledge that. I can acknowledge that. And all I could do is say, I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry for wasting your time, from giving you a hassle, from seeming like that I'm a problem or having a problem with authority when I know I'm really not. But I can't stop you from seeing it the way that you see it. So I could work on it and try my best to make you see me and like the way that I want you to see me as. So um, I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry for having to sit in front of the board and waste your time for the footage. Sir. You know, so I'm apologizing for everything and just hoping that I can get a chance to keep accomplishing in life and not have to go back out there to society without nothing. And have to start all over again. So all I can just say is I'm sorry for everything, all the misinterpretation Fine. things. Ms. Kearney? Yeah, so um, I, I just want to say um, that I really believe that Gennaro is a different person than he was. Um, but I think over the last few months, Gennaro and I have talked a lot about his experience with law enforcement. And, um, and we've talked about what it means now to be given the opportunity to be on parole and to be under parole supervision. And um, I think Gennaro fully understands what it means, what the opportunity is, and that it is a different circumstance than maybe the, the Gennaro has experienced before, which is that parole, his parole officer and parole in general is not, you know, is not trying to do anything to harm Gennaro in any way, but rather is there to support him in this opportunity to, to turn his life around, which I really believe that he has. As you heard from Mia, um, for the first time in his life, um, and I, I'm sure you have seen his history, he has, he has spent a lot of time um, inside of the DOC. And now, since he's been just in the last year, he has been able to start a successful business. Um, he has, like Mia said, he was approved for credit cards for the first time, which I, for myself, is, is pretty a mundane thing. But I think it shows that his excitement about that demonstrates how excited Gennaro is to become a contributing member of society um, and how motivated he is to do that. And um, I've spoken at length with his mother and with Trinisha and some other family and friends and about not just his clear investment in his business and in supporting his family, but as Trinisha said, he went to all of her doctor appointments with Princess. Um, he was very much looking forward to becoming her very active father in Princess's life, as he has with his other children. Um, and I really, as he said to you, this was a situation where some he felt threatened by police officers, but also I think some of his his old experiences with authority came up um, in his head. And I think, you know, he has experienced some trauma in that and he had a, had a reaction. Um, and he understands now, um, you know, what it means to be paroled and, and the need to control those reactions and to respond in a way that um, that is appropriate for specifically for his parole officer, given that his parole officer is there to support him. Um, I'll also say that, as Mia said, um, he's very interested in therapy. Gennaro has, is very um, self-aware um, in the way that he understands, you know, as he was speaking about his communication, um, that he is looking for support and we are very excited to give him that support so that he can work through some of that. And so he has a chance, I'm sure you all are aware of, sometimes trauma reactions can happen without thinking. And I think his, his 
um, engagement in mental health will help him have those skills where he can, um, instead of having that reaction happen automatically, um, he will have a minute to process and to think and respond in the way that he wants to respond. Um, because like I said, this is a different Gennaro than, than he was in the past. Um, and, and I think this is kind of the last piece for him in being able to address some of those experiences he's had in the past so that moving forward, he can respond to his parole officer and law enforcement in a way that is in, in, um, is congruent with what he would like to present to society. Um, so I would ask, what we are asking is that um, you consider a technical violation rather than a revocation in this circumstance. Gennaro has taken responsibility as you know for um for refusing to identify himself to the police officers um i would also just note in terms of that case i think um as Gennaro says they are familiar they know who Gennaro is um and i think that they believed that he was doing something that he was not um they believe that he had a, a firearm on him um and i think Gennaro knows and and as you spoke to um it might have been able to be cleared up more much more quickly if Gennaro had had spoken to the police but he you know he felt scared and he ran away and that's what got us into this situation um and in the future as I said, with the support of our office, with the support of his family, this is not a situation that Gennaro will be in again. Um, and he fully understands what the opportunity, the opportunity of parole and the need to be in regular contact with his parole officer, who's really, you know, who is there to help him in this process. Um, so I would just ask the board to um, consider a technical violation and allow Gennaro to return to the life that he is, he is you know, finally being able to build in just the last year um, and and know that he has not just the support of his family, but the full support of our office and getting all of the services he needs, specifically mental health services to help him begin to process um, and, and to respond differently in the future. Thank you very much. Appreciate your comments. Can I say uh, something one more time? Can I say one more thing, please? If you no, don't mind. No, sir. All right. I recommend executive session to discuss confidential matters related to this case. Second. There's been a, a, a motion and second for executive session to discuss confidential matters. Please call the roll. Yes. 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 Uh, we're going to go into executive session to discuss confidential matters. Uh, we will be adjourned momentarily. We'll return with, with a decision. Okay, Mr. Sims. Mr. Sims, uh, yes, yes, sir. You know th this this isn't an easy case, and the reason it's not an easy case is because of you and your attitude. I'm gonna be very honest with you. Uh, you know, you've got you've got a a expiration date coming up fairly soon. If if you had more time to serve. I probably would sit here and say, I'm going to revoke you, send you back to prison and get you to do some more programs. But you're going to get out pretty soon, regardless of what we do today. And I, I, I just want to tell you a few things. Number one, I don't doubt that maybe those cops didn't target you. I don't doubt there was a lot of extenuating circumstances about that arrest. I don't know whether you had a gun or you didn't have a gun. We won't know that answer. Uh, but you ended up in jail because you ran. And you got a serious attitude problem. And, and let me tell you something. Officer Bertrand, I was expecting him to get up here and tell me how bad you were and put your butt in jail. But he did. He was very straightforward and very honest about what he's been trying to do with you. If you can't get along with that man, you ain't going to be able to get along with anybody. And that's a real problem. Now, your lawyer and, and your, your, uh, your advocate with the public defender's office have a plan. They've got something hopefully that will help you. You know, you've been around a long time. You've been in jail a lot of times. You've been arrested a lot of times. You've been convicted a lot of times. You know the, you know the role. You know the role. You know, this is no news to you. If you don't change, you're going to end up in prison and you'll never get out. 
or you're going to get shot one night doing something. So you better change your lifestyle. You've been helping your mother. That's a good thing. you got a baby that you need to take care of. That's a good thing. So I'm going to give you a break. My vote, one vote. My vote is do not revoke with the following special conditions. Number one, that you follow religiously the plan that's been outlined by the, the public defender's office in New Orleans, which includes going to uh, First 72 Plus, uh, doing those things. I want you to report to your parole officer weekly every week until you get off of parole. Now that's a phone call, that's a text, that's whatever. But some communication to your parole officer, whoever that is, where you are and what you're doing. And one of the things that I wanna make sure, and I'm not sure that it was in the package, but I want you to take a, a significant long-term anger management. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. I'm just one vote, but you know, Mr. Sims, if you don't change your attitude and, and you, you, this is going to happen to you time and time again. So good luck to you. Ms. Wise. Oh, thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Sims, I've listened, I've listened, I've gone, I've gone back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Uh, yeah, I'm a retired probation parole officer. Yeah, I, I, and you know, I've dealt with knuckleheads like you. And you just did, you just want to be a knucklehead. And uh, but you got to see uh how you're not winning. First of all, I don't understand why you out at night at eight o'clock at night just hanging out and you got 10 children. You know, you need to be inside. You know the road, you know how the officers drive through and all that. Don't put yourself in those situations. Find right. some other kind of place to be that time of the evening so you won't come in contact with that because you already know. And then when it happens, you act like you're surprised. And that makes no sense. I agree. You, change, you, you got to change what you do for entertainment, what you're doing out at night. I mean, you, you just you don't need to be out there. You're too old for that. So, But I'm, I feel inclined because of the, the case that's presented today. You got some help. You can't say nobody never helped you because you had a lot of help you today. If you take advantage of it, we will know. But I'm taking a chance on you. I'm going to vote to do not revoke, and I concur with all the special conditions set forth by Mr. Marabella. And if you got a question about it, you, you need to call. If, 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 if your officer is not in, ask me to the officer supervisor, speak kindly. You know, and if you have to leave a voicemail message, say that my name is so and so and so. I still live at so and so and so, and I'm just checking in. I, nobody's answering the call. I'm just checking in. You got to do your due diligence. It's called being humble. It's something you have to get, yeah, hold your head down, because that's what that's called being humble. Because you want to get off supervision and stay off. Best wishes to you, sir. Thank you, uh, Ms. Uh, Mr. Uh, Freeman. Okay, uh, Mr. Sims, that's no use for me to reiterate everything they said. I think you're totally lying about you at your mother's house. Telling him you were going to be there at seven, leaving at six. I don't think you were staying there. Point blank, end of story. I was a probation officer for 35 years. So I, I dealt with a few more than Ms. Wise. Mm -hmm. uh, you have no respect for law enforcement. Uh, law enforcement, you have no respect for authority. And that's your whole problem. You think you know it all. Uh, my vote today is to revoke. Um, I just wish you did have more time to do. You're a seventh felony offender. If you hadn't learned by now, these last two months in jail hadn't taught you nothing. So my vote's to revoke. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. Uh, you have two votes to, uh, to uh, continue you on parole with special conditions uh, and one vote to deny. So uh, you'll be paroled. I mean, you'll be uh, released. Uh, with the following conditions, and that is you will follow religiously the outline that's set forth by the Public Defender's Office of New Orleans. Uh, you will attend a long-term anger management program, and you will report weekly 
in some fashion to your parole officer. That parole officer will dictate how you report to him or her, okay? Yes, sir. Uh, I it's up to you, Mr. Sims. You can you can change your attitude. You can you can try to get along, or you can keep doing what you're doing, and you're likely to end up back in prison. So good luck to you. That's something I don't. Want, that's a place that I don't want to be the rest of my life. And I can acknowledge and admit that I have a anger problem, man. That's been my downfall my whole life. It's crumbled me in so many ways and areas. And I'm trying to work on it frivolously. I don't want that to be a burden on me and keep on setting me back in life. I've acknowledged that. Well, I, I hope you can do something about it. So good luck to you. Sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you.